Well, it's something that really um, uh, struck me, uh, having lived there from 2002 to 2005 when I was uh, covering uh, the Middle East um, from there, it was, at least even at that point, uh, during the Second Intifada, both uh, Israelis and, well, in particular, Israeli Jews and Palestinians still seemed to have a connection to one another. They still, there were still relationships. Uh, obviously, things were very tense. There was a lot of death, and, and uh, so, things were not necessarily rosy, but what struck me this time was that there just seemed to be a complete disconnect, that each side vilified the other and had absolutely no contact with the other, and it was sort of institutionalized. So I set about looking into, uh, you know, if that in fact was the case, um, and in, <laughs> that certainly was the conclusion that was reached by uh, people who were involved in negotiations, people who were experts, uh, psychologists, um, you know, on both sides I, I spoke to them, and I did find a mother-daughter combination, which was interesting. I wanted to sort of have a uh, look at whether this was a generational thing, because again, there was a period of time when Israeli Jews and um, Arabs had much more contact with one another. And so, uh, so I did find a mother-daughter sort of pairing, it just worked out that way. It was actually mother and, and family, mother and children, and mother and daughter on the uh, Israeli Arab side in this case, or um, actually Jerusalemite Arabs in, in this case, um, and also uh, Israeli Jewish side outside of Jerusalem, and it was just very interesting to me how uh, they both had, like, again, the mothers had contact with uh, the other side, and the, the daughters did not, and they had this, this very vilified view of what the other side thought, very generic. And so with a story like this where it sort of catches fire in some ways, um, do you, what do you do with the feedback? Do you listen to the feedback? Do you read the comments? Do you, how, how, what's your reaction to that? It's really tough, especially with this story. People are so galvanized, whether they're in the place that we're talking about or whether they're actually elsewhere. Um, it's, it's just Im impossible for them uh, to seem to understand the other side. So I try not to read too much into it. I mean, my concern is that I uh, you know, present both sides, that I try to weed out the stuff that, that's extraneous or is not correct or, or it's just inflammatory, and really look at what, what the story is you know, and try to get comments that will hopefully propel the dialogue uh, you know, or the, the, the story forward and, and not just be more of the same. So one of the things that you mentioned there where you're talking about what it's like to be a woman as a reporter, um, I think there must be some really great benefits to it. Some of the people that I've talked to are like, yeah, it's like invaluable. Um, and then at other times it's a, it's a real hindrance. Um, so what, yeah, what, what's your experience with it? Um, well, I've, I've found, and I've certainly reported from a lot of areas where being a woman, I mean, where women are second class citizens or women can't even move without men, you know, like Mahram, you know, certain very conservative Muslim countries. Um, Afghanistan was among them prior to the Taliban falling, and even now it's still a very conservative place. So um, I encountered a lot of difficulties on one hand in terms of being taken seriously as a bureau chief, trying to set up a bureau there, trying to make sure that the male employees I had were not running circles around me, thinking you know, that uh, as a woman they could get away with a lot. Um, you know, they, they did learn to come to respect me, and, and, I mean, I, and I do respect the cultures. I don't try to act like a you know, crazy American when I go to these places. I mean, I you know, would wear a headscarf. I would wear conservative clothing. Um, you know, I wouldn't make a big scene of drinking alcohol or whatever. I mean, you know, I would do it in venues where I was with, perhaps with other Westerners, but not in front of the Afghans. Um, and so I think they had a lot of respect for me because I respected them, you know, um, like during Ramadan, not eating out in the open, that sorts of thing, uh, that sort of thing. But then on the other hand, um, it was a real benefit because again, if we use Afghanistan as the example, I mean, this is a place where um, men may be good friends with other men, but you will never ever meet their families. You'll never ever meet their women. You'll never ever meet their daughters. Um, as a woman, however, um, when you enter into these relationships, whether it's interviews or whatever, um, with uh, various community leaders, they immediately want to bring you in to meet the women. So it's like you have access to half of the population, which men don't necessarily, male reporters don't necessarily uh, have access to. So when was the last time you were in um, a zone with uh, sort of more bang bang, as it were? What was the, the one before Israel where there was, you were seeing some, some serious um, it was actually in eastern Ukraine, in Donetsk. It was uh, following a, 
a march there. It was a pro-Ukrainian march. I mean, things are very tense in eastern Ukraine at the moment, and I was there in May, uh, April, May time frame. And I had uh, decided to cover this pro-Ukrainian march because they were the, the people who were actually felt that they still wanted a unified Ukraine. They may have been in the majority, but they felt very intimidated uh, there. So the fact that people would turn out to go do this, I thought, okay, this is going to spark trouble. I need to be here and see what's going on. So uh, as, as uh, they were marching, I was with them, um, and we did have a security advisor there um, just because it's, it's a good thing. <laughs> You've got people with microphones and stuff running around. It's, you know, you're, you're a target, unfortunately. Journalists have become targets in many of these conflicts. So uh, anyway, he was behind me. Um, I also had my translator, my fixer, with me, and we were walking, and suddenly this, this, this somebody threw something, and guns were being fired, and, and stun grenades, and... I was sort of being grabbed by both sides. The poor fixer was, was uh, rather uh, frightened. He had not experienced something like this before. And it, it takes some getting used to. So he's dragging me one way. The sorry, the security guy is dragging me the other. And uh, <laughs> so we had to get behind a building um, to escape. I mean, it was, I've been in far worse situations. But yeah, this was, it was clear that, um, you know, the people, the, the ones, the it was unclear who actually did it, whether the police started this or whether these were thugs, whether the thugs were permitted to actually do something, whether this meant the police was uh, in cahoots with the rebels, or whether this meant that the police just simply said, we don't get paid, we get paid a third of what the Russian police officers get paid, why should we get involved? You know, All these things never were clear, but in the end, um, there were a number of pretty severe injuries. Nobody was killed, but again, um, you know, that was... I would say that that counts as bang bang, even if it wasn't the worst I've ever been in. Well, so yeah, I mean, I guess one of the questions is just, I'm sure you've gotten asked it a ton of times, which is just, are you an adrenaline junkie? Like, <laughs> does this stuff just, are you, do you just go and you're just like, yeah, I'm, I'm going for it. And it's like some of, is it just incredibly exciting and you want to go back for more? Is, is that part of it? I would be a liar if I said there isn't one, some element of that, obviously. I mean, uh, th there is no doubt that uh, all of us are adrenaline junkies to some extent or another. But um, for me, it's, it really is a fascination with the stories. Um, it's a fascination with how people survive um, and thrive, in fact, in these horrific environments. I mean, whether it's like some mountaintop in Afghanistan where there's a, a village that has rarely had contact with the outside world, where they spend half the year doing um, subsistence farming and the other half just, you know, eating, <laughs> it's, you know, survive, just trying to survive the cold winters and how these people just, you know, how they interact when they, when they do have contact with the outside world. I mean, to me, these are just like opportunities uh, that, that are incredible. I mean, as, as a human being, I feel very, very privileged to be able to, to see this stuff up close. So it's not, for me, it really is beyond, I mean, especially at this stage of the game, I, I almost, would like to say that it's nice if I don't have to be running from bombs, you know, exploding. <laughs> it's really not something that I look for. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, it's, I, I mean, I honestly, I, I don't like being shot at. I don't like explosions, you know. I, so, so it's, I, I think that the adrenaline junkie thing maybe at the beginning was more interesting and has become decreasingly so. Yeah, the, uh, I heard one story on NPR from a few years back where you were, there was some very real action happening and you had that question there, like, is this worth it, like this moment, if this is the moment. And I think um, uh, it's got to be a tough thing to sort of reflect on both while you're there or when you're back. It's the sort of like, is this story worth it? Yeah, well, especially that one that you're mentioning where the Marine was killed uh, in Marja. Um, I had been pushing, I mean, I had gone on this, this uh, assignment basically with the military, this embed with the military. I mean, here there's this major operation going on to clear out the Taliban. And because of my gender, uh, the military um, had been reluctant to put me on the front lines, you know, with the troops. So they kept having me sort of in the, I mean, I was with the unit, but I wasn't really on a patrol. I wasn't part of this action. And I'm like, come on people, you know, at some point. So I really had pushed to finally get on this patrol. And, um, and then I, you know, the, the, company commander uh, was, the captain was very, very upset because he really thought a reporter was going to, a female reporter or less was going to die on his watch because this, this had happened. My husband and son, we always had an a, a arrangement. Uh, my husband's also a journalist um, by training and he's a freelancer and uh, he, at the moment. And he, we always had this agreement where we would take a vote, a family vote. And if we weren't 100% agreed, then I would not do assignments. Um, hmm. it, now, this wasn't so much a blow by blow assignment. It was more like a long term thing. Um, for example, with Israel, um, they came with me, you know, there, and we agreed as a family to do this. When I went to Afghanistan, it was with their blessing. Um, I mean, that, that to me is important because it's a lot of stress on them as well. 
Um, uh, Eric, in particular, uh, my husband in particular, had a really hard time uh, when I was in Iraq, and I was uh, taken by Mahdi Army, detained um, for eight hours, and it, they had actually issued an execution order for me. And um, you know, they, so here I'm like. <laughs> and vanished at gunpoint. Um, for some reason, they took my phones, but didn't understand that I was that my laptop was connected to a satellite dish. So I actually did have internet uh, communications. <laughs> they left. They let me stay in the hotel room. They were trying to drag me off to some mosque, and I convinced them, you know, as a, as a woman, they should let me stay in the room. So um, while this was going on, I'm writing, you know, frantic emails to people saying I'm in trouble, um, you know. <laughs> And um, my husband was called. But I said, please, somebody call my husband because I'm not going to send him an email saying, you know, somebody needs to call him. So at some point, the managing editor in Washington called um, him and, and said, you know, be ready. We, we, you may need to go to Jordan to make an appeal, you know, because they, they it wasn't clear whether I was being kidnapped or what the deal was, you know, so they, but they thought he might have to make a televised appeal. And, and Eric said at that point, that was really, you know, he had had it. <laughs> he was like, so then. <laughs> Wow, that's in the end, nice. I was released. It's a, you know, we won't get into too much about, you know, but I, I ended up being released. And then I, initially I was like, okay, I got to get out of, I was in Najaf, Iraq at the time. I'm like, I got to get out of here. And then I, after a while, I was like, well, I can't leave. It's nighttime, A. And B, I'm really mad that they did this. And C, tomorrow, Muqtada al-Sadr, whose Mahdi army was the one that took me, might be speaking at the mosque. You know, I have permission to be here. This, this ridiculous detention, you know, wasn't based in fact anyway. So I wanted to stay. And that's when my husband got really mad at me and said, okay, you know what? I've never asked you in, <laughs> in all of our marriage, never once asked you to leave. He says, but I've had it. You need to leave now. So I said, wow. okay, fine. So I left. Um, but then he was also the one six months later who said when Sadr was back in the news again, and, um, and he says, well, why aren't you going to Iraq? I'm like, well, I thought you didn't. He goes, no, you, nobody knows the story like you do. You need to go. <laughs> so, so I went again But uh, after that.